Humans are curious creatures. From the dawn of mankind, we have been fascinated by our surrounding universe and the complex worlds that are contained within us. We have been trying to find reliable ways to measure and describe inside and outside realms that sparked our interest. To this day, science has been the most reliable set of tools we have found to describe the world around us. Scientific method is its basis. For the purpose of better organization, we'll split this video in three sections. 1. Brief history of the scientific method. 2. What is scientific method? 3. Pillars and principles of scientific method. Let's start with number 1. The brief history of the scientific method. The quest of human inquiry for knowledge and truth started with faith and intuition. People of the ancient world paid great attention to movement of celestial bodies. They carefully documented positions of planets and stars over time. But people were always susceptible to pareidolia or seeing patterns even if there are no patterns at all. People of the ancient world were prone to ascribing the effects of celestial movement to the happenings in the world surrounding them. Perhaps a huge disaster hit the Earth, like an earthquake followed by unprecedented volcanic activity. The ancient scholars were inclined to correlate these events with celestial movements. The worldly events became the consequence of glorious celestial battles, the battles between gods. The priests became the ones that could soothe the divine wrath and comprehend the divine truth. Consequently, they became the authority. Authority became the source of knowledge. Authority, rulers, and other structures of power were now able to mold the world and shape the truth so they could ensure the existing social order. But curious people were trying to find the truth despite the claims that it was already known. Philosophers and scientists throughout centuries fought against religious authority and political leaders for the right way of finding the true nature of reality. However, they faced frighteningly powerful opposition, especially in the late medieval and early modern period, also known as Period of Inquisition. These brave humans faced persecution and sometimes even death for ideas they propagated. Because of this, they played an important role in the development of scientific method. Great philosophers of classical antiquity were the first thinkers who thought of the possibility that faith and authority are fallible and truly discussed ways to acquire knowledge. Plato thought that objects which construct our world are mere shadows of their ideal form and that we could realize the true nature of reality through use of rational reasoning and a priori hypotheses. Plato taught the doctrine of ideal forms through his metaphor of the cave. He imagined a cave in which a person is only able to see the opposite side of the cave. The cave is echoing with sounds of distant voices and this person can see the shadows on the wall. They are certain that these shadows present the reality. Plato then assumed that they are able to move. This person starts to explore the cave and becomes blinded with the light of fire. They are stunned when they realize that what they thought to be reality had been the mere shadows of objects in front of fire. They then leave the cave to be blinded again, this time with the more intense light of the sun. After their eyes got used to the light, they are now able to see the true reality, the ideal forms. They are finally free. Being free, however, comes with a cost. Once one is familiarized with the light of the truth, one becomes blind to the darkness of the cave, and other people cannot understand the blindness to what they perceive as truth. Plato's disciple Aristotle disagreed with his teacher's approach to finding the truth only through rational reasoning, as he was aware of the importance of sensory experience and observation in understanding the world. However, humans are often prone to selective observation and memorizing things in accordance with their pre-existing beliefs. Aristotle was aware of this fact, so he also defined syllogism, a form of deductive reasoning that derives a conclusion from two premises, which pretty much established logic as a discipline. Fast forward 14th century to the Islamic Golden Age. Philosophers Ibn al-Haytham, al-Biruni, and Avicenna played an often diminished role in evolution of scientific inquiry as they started to use systematic observation, experimentation, and mathematical evidence to complement logical reasoning and prove or reject hypotheses, hundreds of years before scientific method took its contemporary form. However, despite captivating efforts of thousands of intellectuals, the progress was very slow until the invention of the printing press which facilitated distribution of information and expanded its reach to a greater number of people, marking the beginning of the new era in science. 
human knowledge experienced an explosive expansion. Wider availability of books quenched curiosity of generations of human beings. One of the intensely curious members of ensuing generations was Galileo Galilei, who is often considered as the father of modern science. Galileo started a silent revolution which led to separation of science from philosophy, ethics, and theology that were under the strict control of the Catholic Church at the time. He was one of the first people in Europe to explicitly advocate scientific approach based on observation and experimentation rather than reconciling with one widely accepted at the time. These were the first no notable steps towards the liberation from the authority as the source of knowledge. Galileo's resistance against the church's authority resulted in home imprisonment until the end of his days others were not so lucky. As dark as these times were, a few sparks of illumination could be found. The formal birth of two very important epistemological schools of thought marked this era. René Descartes came up with a form of almost radical skepticism known as Cartesian doubt. He rejected any claim he had even the slightest suspicion about and was left with the one he is famous for, cogito ergo sum, or I think, therefore I am. Because of his belief that truth can only be discovered through reason, reason, he is considered the father of rationalism. Francis Bacon, on the other hand, as the father of empiricism, argued that knowledge is solely based upon careful, inductive observation. The Age of Enlightenment illuminated the darkness of ignorance and popularized science. Education was more accessible than ever. A few generations passed by and Karl Popper appeared with one of the most fundamental principles of modern scientific method. Popper believed that we could never fully prove a hypothesis by observation, but we could refute it by gathering contradictory evidence. He suggested that scientists should engage in experiments that could maximize the chance of refutation by hypothesis. The Black Swan Theory is a beautiful reminder of the importance of refutability principle. For thousands of years, observation led Europeans to believe that all swans are white. They were certain that this statement was true. However, to their astonishment, in the 17th century, European explorers had found the first black swans in Australia. Refutability criteria, as proposed by Popper, states that no hypothesis should be considered as the ultimate truth. On the other hand, Thomas Kuhn stated that science is constructed of paradigms often defined by a consensus of scientific community. Hypotheses are generated to be in accordance with current paradigms. Contradictory evidence leads to revisions of hypotheses only if it fits the framework. If not, the results are ignored. However, when contradictory evidence stacks up, it results in a crisis and paradigm shift is needed. The new paradigm is constructed to replace the old one and the cycle starts again. Some find this approach controversial, but it seems that it works effectively. Paradigm shifts are not very frequent and it means that our scientific paradigms are relatively well constructed. On the other hand, the hottest example of the possible paradigm shift in the near future may be the controversial EM drive, the type of propulsion without a propellant. Recent peer-reviewed findings show that EM drive works. Although the way it works is mysterious, EM drive could be able to refute the momentum conservation principle, one of the fundamental laws in physics. That is the reason for controversy and countless debates in the scientific community. If it really conflicts with the law of momentum conservation, EM drive may be the first evidence in this series that will be needed for the eventual paradigm shift. Having all that mentioned, let's get to part two. But what the heck is the scientific method? Scientific method is a set of different procedures that science uses in scientific research with the goal of learning about the natural world and presenting results of scientific studies to other researchers and eventually to the public. These procedures include systematic observation, which consists of observation, measurement, and experimentation, as well as formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses. To understand scientific method, one should understand the meaning of and the distinction between fundamental statements in science such as hypotheses or theories. Hypothesis is a proposed explanation of phenomena that presents a starting point for further scientific inquiry. Scientific theory is a well-substantiated explanation of some aspect of the natural world based on a body of facts that have been repeatedly confirmed through observation and experimentation. It explains in detail why some phenomenon exists and what causes it. Scientific law is a formal statement that describes a phenomenon without detailed explanation of why it exists or what causes it. It is narrower in scope than scientific theory. Scientific theories and laws may be simply referred to as scientific facts. And finally, we're off to part three. But what are the fundamental pillars and principles of the scientific method? 
Let's say that you're Charles Darwin and you want to explain the theory of evolution. You should start by asking questions. After you found a question that seriously caught your attention, for example, what's up with birds and their beaks? Then you should do an elaborate background research on the topic concerning your question. Find out as much as you can about it. You can do your research by exploring reports of peer-reviewed studies, reading through articles in scientific journals, reading books, and similar. After you are confident enough that you profoundly understood the material, you should provide a hypothesis that answers your questions. For example, say that over many, many years, birds have evolved to the point where their beaks have adapted to the food they eat. The hypothesis must be falsifiable and testable, otherwise the truth would be completely arbitrary. If your hypothesis meets the requirements, you need to test it through conducting experiments. Finished with the experiments? Did they confirm or disprove your hypothesis? Either way, you need to analyze all the data collected throughout the stages of your study and draw a meaningful conclusion out of it. If your study was successfully conducted while following the standardized process, you present the results to the scientific community and the public. However, certain steps of scientific process require following specific criteria. Let's say a person, for example your friend Dave, does not believe in the theory of evolution. Evolution is not just a scientific theory. It is a well-established scientific paradigm supported by strong sets of evidence in the form of comparative anatomy, comparison of DNA structure, species distribution, embryology, fossil record, observation, and more. As he is someone who does not believe in such theory, it is expected of Dave to present an alternative that describes an aspect of the living world better than the theory of evolution does and then conduct a study. Dave needs to construct a hypothesis on how life on this planet took its current form. His hypothesis must be empirically testable and both logically and practically falsifiable. There must be a way to gather empirical evidence and perform observation. Dave needs to start collecting the evidence to support his hypothesis while following the guidelines presented by scientific method. The evidence must be generated through experimentation or formal logic and rational reasoning. If Dave's hypothesis satisfied these criteria, experimentation can begin. Dave must design his experiments so that other scientists can repeat them without his presence to check validity and trustworthiness of results. All procedures of Dave's study must be explicitly defined and the study must be fully transparent. There must not be an internal logical inconsistency. If Dave's experiments somehow result in confirmation of his hypothesis, he needs to analyze data and draw final conclusions. Now, after his study was conducted, it needs to be successfully replicated and reviewed by other scientists several times. But this is just the beginning of Dave's scientific adventures. Now, he needs to find a hypothesis for another aspect of the living world superior to that of evolution, and the cycle starts again. This process of conducting studies following the fundamental principles of scientific method needs to be repeated until the evidence stacks up to the point where paradigm shift is required. Then Dave's research could be used to develop a working theory which may finally be accepted in the scientific community. As seen in this example, scientific method requires careful, detailed, and systematic approach to exploration of the natural world. It is by far the most advanced way we have to gain knowledge about our universe. Thinkers for many scientific disciplines and branches of philosophy shaped it throughout millennia. The fundamental steps and principles of scientific method ensure a reliable path for us to take on our ultimate quest to find the truth. Thanks for watching. Here's the subscribe button. Please click it for the sake of science. Scientists and researchers will be able to accomplish much more if you do it. Maybe you'll even win a Nobel Prize for it. Press like and share if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe for more of our content.